Good afternoon. Welcome to the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee's Task Force on E-Government Forum. Uh, this is the first of these forums uh, that the uh, caucus has, is holding this year. Uh, for those of you that uh, did not get an introduction, the caucus is a bipartisan group of nearly 160 members of the House and Senate working to educate their colleagues about the promise and the potential of the Internet. The advisory committee of the caucus works to educate policymakers on the internet and related issues. Uh, and we are a subgroup of the caucus. My name is Ari Schwartz. I am from the Center for Democracy and Technology. And with Uli Werner uh, from SAP, we co-chair the, uh, the task force on e-government issues, which was formed this year to, because we felt that the issues uh, that uh, of e-government were starting to come more to the fore and that it was really time to start organi organizing and, and getting all of the groups in the room that were interested in these issues to really do the education for the members that were starting to look at this issue in more detail. Uh, and in order to do that, we felt that the first step was instead of writing our own information, uh, really to try and collect everything that had been done to date. And what we've done is we put together this briefing book. Uh, it's uh, a little too big to print, so we felt that CD-ROM was really a great way to navigate uh, and send people to information for the future. We hope that, uh, that particularly staff, if, 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 staff, members, if uh, staff members of the Hill want to get one of these or get some extra copies, please let us know. But uh, those are available up front for those of you that haven't gotten them to this point. Uh, the, 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 the task force, in, in order to do this, we went beyond the usual setup of the uh, advisory committee and we asked for people to send in information from uh, all over the world that they have written on these issues so that, so that we can really get a full briefing. Uh, the, the Internet Caucus really has uh, some, some great leaders uh, on these issues. Uh, Representative Goodlatte, Representative Bra Boucher have both been uh, worked on uh, e-government issues. Uh, Senator Burns has really been a leader in, uh, and, and one of the co-founders of the, uh, the Congressional Internet Caucus. Uh, but I have the pleasure of introducing uh, one, the, the fourth chair, uh, one of the founders of the caucus, uh, and one of the longest and most ardent champions of e-government in the Senate. He's a winner of the uh, American Library Association's James Madison Award. Uh, which, for, which is for the freedom of information, and it is one of the uh, chief architects uh, of the EFOIA amendments that passed, and really they're one of the first and strongest uh, laws that, w that we have moving e-government forward. Uh, and uh, it's my real pleasure to introduce Senator Patrick Leahy. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Harry, and I appreciate that. I'm delighted to see so many people here, and I thank you for what you've done to put this together, and Billy Warner of SAP, the other members of the government task force. These, um, uh, these Internet uh, caucuses, as you know, have gotten, become more and more popular, and I think it's because of all the work that folks like you do to make it, make it done and make it work right. And I, I'm going to look forward to going through the uh, through the CD-ROM because we know that electronic government or e-government can make all government more accessible if we use it right. The, the Internet has such a unique way for the American public, again, if it's done right, it's a unique way for the American public to see public records in their official forms, not snippets in the press or snippets have been edited and with somebody else's comments, but they can look at it and make their own judgments. Now, some on the Hill last week probably were distracted by an Irish uh, event that goes on in connection with March 17th. And only because of that, some of you who are Irish, like Patrick Joseph Leahy, uh, may have missed it Friday, March 16th, the day before St. Patrick's Day, was National FOIA Day. And I know most of you must have been out uh, excited and celebrating that and probably did not have enough uh, leftover excitement for St. Patrick's Day, but I would urge that next year try to do them both in connection with each other. It was the 35th anniversary of the Freedom of Information Act. For those of us who think the Freedom of Information Act was something we've always had, probably written in the Constitution, 
It really is only 35 years old. It's been important to it. serve the country right because it tells everybody in the country what the government is doing and sometimes even more importantly what the government is not doing. Now five years ago we made the last major change to FOIA. That was the electronic freedom of information amendments. I authored those to try to bring the law into the information age. I wanted the legislation to encourage federal agencies to use the internet, to use technology to make government more accessible but also more accountable. Uh, it's very easy to get all, all of us in government uh, to uh, get the word out when we do something we think is great. I want to make sure that the information when we screw up is there too. And storing government information on computers should make it a lot easier for government to find out what is going on and to be able to get that information. I'll give you a couple of uh, examples uh, that we're already seeing. People with sight or hearing impairments, they can use special computer programs. They can translate electronic information into Braille or large print, or it's getting better and better into synthetic speech output. Imagine somebody who wants to pull up on their computer, and we're going to, as, especially as we get more and more voice recognition technology, pull up on their computer the, the latest information from the Veterans Administration, for example. Uh, but they're, they're a blind veteran. Now they can start getting it, uh, and it's just spoken to them. Electronic um, records make it possible to provide dial-up access to any citizen who can use computer networks such as the Internet. That means whether they're sitting in a, a farmhouse on a dirt road in Middlesex, Vermont, where today we're getting another 14 or 15 inches of snow, um, or snowbound in Washington, D.C., because there's been a one and a half inches of snow, <laughs> or whether they're in uh, one of the public reading rooms here in, in Washington. They should be able to get computer networks. They can get direct access to the warehouse of unclassified information stored in, stored in government computer banks. And it is, as the congressman knows, it's a, it is a warehouse. I mean, it is enormous. It would take the size of this building uh, to store the paper records, but it just takes your computer and a mouse click to have it at home. Last Friday, the GAO released a report with Senator Thompson and I requested to see how federal agencies were doing on implementing the E-FOIA amendments. Now, the GAO report has good news and it has bad news. Agencies are establishing electronic reading rooms as required by my E-FOIA amendments, but we found a lot of need to work a lot harder to make sure the required documents are electronically available. What I'd suggest to all of us here, whatever, whoever you work with or for or, or running your own um, uh, company, keep on government to fulfill what EPOIA requires. Uh, we have to fulfill the promise that was made 35 years ago for people to see records when they were predominantly paper records. And we have to keep on fulfilling the same promise today when they're electronic records. And we can uh, use this to open up the halls of Congress to all our citizens. As Senator McCain and Senator Lieberman and I recently introduced legislation to make Congressional Research Service products and lobbyist disclosure reports and Senate gift disclosures reports available over the Internet to the American people. It's a bipartisan resolution to allow every citizen the same access to the wealth of CRS information that a member of Congress enjoys today. I mean, this occurred to me um, a couple of years ago, and I brought back to Vermont with me a couple of CRS reports on a fairly complex subject that I had requested. It was brilliantly put together. It was obvious that an enormous amount of work had gone into researching it. It was very helpful legislation I had, but I have to think that there are probably hundreds, maybe even thousands of other people who would love to have that information, could use it, I uh, could find it valuable. The taxpayers have paid for it. Why shouldn't we make it um, electronically available? And those kind of wonderful research reports that they do could then be available to everybody. Think how we improve life around the country, but also think of how 
the um, uh, people that understand more and better the tremendous experience uh, and, and abilities are the men and women who work here on the Hill in producing these kind of records. So we, in getting all this information from the government, we should also keep in mind one other thing, and that is the privacy considerations. Because when we talk about companies having your medical records or having your credit records, remember the federal government probably has more personal information about all of us than anybody else. The Privacy Law Act, the law that governs how the federal government holds our personal information, has not been updated in 20 years, in 20 years. So Senator Hatch and I have announced plans to hold hearings in the Senate Judiciary Committee to examine how well the government does in protecting the privacy of personal information uh, held. So that's something we should all, we should all work on. And with that, I am privileged to introduce our featured speaker today, Senator Joe Lieberman. Now this is, uh, you probably wonder how we did that. Uh, Joe, one of the things that very few people know about during the uh, vice presidential campaign, we implanted a tiny electronic thing in his ear uh, where his friends can reach him immediately. And as we're in New Englanders, even though he's from one of these southern states in New England, uh, we can contact him. I, I mentioned I did that once in Judiciary Committee when I referred to Ted Kennedy as one of those from Southern State, at which point Senator Thurman turned to the two of us, pointed his finger, and said, I'll tell you boys, you boys, where Southerners are. But, uh, <laughs> but Senator Lieberman's been a leader in e government issues for a long time. He joined with Senator Thompson last spring in launching an interactive website. It asked for the public's views on 40 topics that are being considered for possible e-government legislation. But then he did something even better. Not only did he solicit them, he posted uh, the responses. So people, not only did people around the country know what the responses were, but members of Congress do, too. And he's now preparing to introduce e-government legislation, uh, which he'll describe in uh, greater, uh, greater detail. I think that... What I would say about about Joe and uh, I, I am unfortunately going to have to leave as I say this, but I, I was I will repeat you know the various lies I've most heard. One is of course I'll read your speech in the record tomorrow, but I actually will uh, read what, what Joe said because he has been a leader in this, and he like like I and so many of you feel the government is most accessible and most transparent is the best of all governments, so I'm proud to introduce my good friend, Joe Luberman. Well, thank you, uh, Pat. Thanks for your kind words. Thanks to my uh, neighbor, Nanook of the North. Uh, there's there's no, uh, no finer person, forget Senator in, in the Senate, than uh, Pat Leahy. And I'm proud uh, to have him as a colleague. He's been a real uh, leader in the whole uh, introduction of the Internet to Congress. So uh, I appreciate very much his kind words. Uh, Pat's leadership, which some of you may know, on the e FOIA amendments uh, passed uh, earlier, considerably expanded public access to electronic documents. In fact, that legislation, uh, I think, is, should be considered as the, the, probably the earliest example of e-government legislation even before the term e-government uh, had been coined. So um, he's actually much younger than he looks. Uh, but, you know, he, he was way ahead on, uh, on e-government. So thanks, Pat. Thanks for your kind words. I understand you have to go. And we'll get a, uh, an autographed copy of my remarks to your office uh, later today. Uh, let, let me thank the uh, Internet Caucus for organizing this event and all of you here. This is a... Uh, a very impressive uh, group. We have uh, high officials, and it makes me uh, want to be thoughtful before you and, and conduct myself appropriately. Uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to see this turnout, whether you're from the uh, public interest community, industry, uh, or government, because obviously, uh, as we enter the new world, communication is the key to putting things uh, together in thoughtful and uh, effective policies. Uh, these are exciting times as we trace the 
cutting edge of high technology in the hopes of applying it better uh, to serve the taxpayers. Perhaps I should say a word as I was coming over from another event. A member of the press was with me and, and uh, talked about where, where I was going, and he said, uh, you know, I, I'm not paraphrasing this quite right, but isn't the age of the Internet over? I mean, haven't you been uh, following NASDAQ? A little, being a bit provocative, I'm sure. And uh, there's obviously, to put it graciously, a settling out going on in the industry, but the reality that I don't have to speak at length about here uh, is that the information technology is a transformational development and it is here to stay. Uh, and um, um, the question before us is not um, you know, whether it's going to affect our lives, but how we're going to use it either to make uh, private uh, sector activities more productive, more effective, or to make government um, more uh, effective. And uh, so beyond the stock market, which will be back, I promise you, uh, I can't tell you when, but I promise you it will, uh, we're, we're into a new age, and uh, government has to be um, part of that. Uh, we are moving now in the direction of e-government. And, and as I said more broadly, the question here for government is how quickly we get there and whether we get there on the right and best road. Um, the opportunities for everybody here are just too great to, uh, to ignore. And if we're lucky, to say the obvious, we can not only run our shop more efficiently and, and provide our services more effectively, but we can re-engage the citizenry in the democratic process while restoring the best ideals of public service through cost savings, efficiency, and a wider range of services and information. Did you see the story in the press the other day about how congressional offices are being overwhelmed by emails? Well, that's, a, that's the best example. I mean, it sounds like it's a problem. I suppose in a short-term sense, it's a problem to manage it, but it's an extraordinarily exciting uh, development. I mean, you can never in Congress be at a point where you're getting too much input from the people uh, who sent us here. And uh, um, that, that's, what, that's an example of what we're dealing with. Um, federal, state, and local governments are making significant headway in using Internet-based technologies to provide fast, efficient, and uh, more uh, broadly accessible uh, service uh, to, uh, and a wealth of inf to a wealth of information. But uh, we got a lot more we have to do. E-government as it exists now is, as I see it, a loose-knit mix of ideas, projects, projects and uh, affiliations, often poorly coordinated. Efforts to digitize the federal government specifically have moved uh, in a way that I would describe as selective or uneven, uh, with remarkable innovations in some areas and uh, not much going on uh, in other areas at all. Uh, the end result is that electronic government at the federal level is inconsistent and particularly slow uh, when interagency or intergovernmental coordination is necessary. So uh, the bill that I'm working on, and I appreciate Pat mentioning, uh, Fred Thompson and I uh, thought that the, uh, the way to go on this uh, was to make, in a sense, the medium the message, as McLuhan said. Uh, we, should, we should post some subject matter ideas uh, on our website, and uh, uh, subject matter ideas for this uh, uh, bill, and then invite uh, reactions uh, in that sense to use the net to involve anybody who wanted to be involved in the process of actually drafting uh, this legislation. The rea reactions have been, uh, been uh, strong and actually quite uh, helpful. Uh, the bill uh, that we're in the final stages of, uh, of drafting now and hope to introduce in the next several weeks, next few weeks actually, targets several areas that I think need to improve if the federal government is going to realize the full benefits of, uh, of IT. Uh, most importantly, decisive, focused, top-level leadership is required for the federal government to truly uh, harness the latest information technology. So the bill we're working on would establish a federal chief information officer who would be charged with providing the leadership, vision, communication, coordination, and innovation necessary to maximize governmental effectiveness in using IT. This CIO would be located in OMB, ensuring cooperation with management and budget officials, but it would also have some autonomy uh, to drive the changes necessary here. 
Uh, he or she would be responsible for implementing existing laws on information policy, reviewing agencies, IT budgets, and promoting new e-government initiatives. To be truly effective, uh, the CIO would have to work with a much larger community of interested parties, including the CIO council, uh, program managers at the agency, state and local governments, and interested parties in the private and nonprofit sectors. Now, others in Congress have proposed a federal CIO, and the president is apparently considering the idea uh, as well, in addition to a small interagency IT fund. Uh, I'm very eager to work with the new administration and with others of both parties in Congress to, dis to discuss the uh, strengths and weaknesses of various proposals here. I understand that there are competing concerns and that the various approaches to the CIO question demonstrate uh, the balancing that has to occur. By creating a chief information officer with greater autonomy over information policy, it is not my desire to establish an, an official who will be cut off from the essential processes of government, from the priorities of budget officials and the needs of uh, program managers. Cooperation and coordination are essential here if we want to harness the, the uh, potential of the information uh, revolution. On the other hand, IMB, OMB's tiny information branch, uh, by my uh, perspective, has been buried in layers of bureaucracy for a very long time. The people who make crucial decisions about how information and services will be provided uh, to the American public need to think of themselves uh, as answering not just to whatever administration happens to be in office at that time, but also, and more importantly, to, uh, to the broader um, public, uh, the American public. The CIO and my bill will have that clear mandate and uh, the tools to bring about real change. Another uh, focus of the bill will be promoting the shift to integrated service delivery. There are many government entities that still seem to view e-government as converting paper processes uh, to their electronic equivalent. But as uh, those of you who are here in this room know, I'm sure a, a truly functional approach should focus on organizing information and services uh, according to citizens' needs uh, without regard to where the jurisdiction of one agency stops and another begins. Using money from an interagency IT fund that would be uh, created under my bill and is larger than the one that I gather the President is, is proposing, the CIO uh, would have the capacity to promote efforts to re-engineer governmental processes and services. One central component of that effort, and a very important one, will be further development of uh, a federal government portal a single place on the internet that brings together in a, uh, an easily usable format a wide array of information uh, services and interactive uh, applications from and with uh, the federal government. Uh, among its other provisions, the bill uh, would also ensure that, uh, that the American people have greater access to a variety of government information. Uh, so we would promote innovative uses of information technology, for instance, to respond to natural uh, disasters, uh, to reduce the reporting burdens of regulated uh, industries, to make agency proceedings more accessible to the public. And the bill establishes very strong new privacy protections pertaining to personal information uh, stored electronically uh, by the government. Um, E-government uh, obviously is not and should not be a, a partisan issue, and, and uh, uh, so far here in Washington, fortunately, it has not become that. Uh, this is all about improving the way government provides information and services, making the government more efficient, and ultimately making government both more accessible and more accountable, which, which are really at the heart of uh, making more real the fundamental promise that the framers of the country made when they put the country together, doing it in a very, very modern context, which obviously they could not have dreamed of, but making it uh, work better 
the old principles work better with this with this new technology. Uh, the new technologies themselves are not going to solve uh, our problems. We need innovative leadership here. Uh, we need uh, the willingness to take some risks, and we need a willingness to work uh, together. Uh, if we can bring all that uh, to the scene, I think we're going to be able to harness these new technologies uh, to better serve the public, and after all, uh, that's what we're supposed to be doing here. I thanks very much for your interest in the subject. Uh, as soon as we, we're ready in the next couple of weeks to uh, introduce the bill, we'll circulate it as widely as we can. Uh, in the spirit of the uh, of the time and of the net, uh, while we're going to give it our best shot, we don't consider it uh, to be uh, you know etched in stone. So we welcome uh, uh, your responses to it, and I wish you the best in your proceedings today. Thank you very very much. Well, we're uh, lucky enough to have an another one of the uh, Congressional Internet Caucus co-chairs here today. Uh, Representative Goodlatte has been uh, has been was the chair of last Congress and, and this Congress from the House and uh, really has been a leader particularly on uh, e-government issues and uh, and privacy issues uh, and uh, we I look forward to hear what he has to say. I'll be brief. First thing I want to say is that when you use the internet, you have to be careful. One of my constituents went to Florida recently. He was going to meet his wife down there. He got there a day early. So when he got there, he flipped open his laptop. He went online, and he sent her an email, and he signed it, your husband. But when he addressed it, he put an extra backslash, and it didn't go to his wife. It went to a woman whose husband had passed on the week before. When she opened up the email, she screamed and fell on the floor, and her adult daughter, who was staying with her at the time, came rushing in, and after she got her back in her chair and made sure she was okay, she went and read the email. And here's what it said. Finally got here today. Looking forward to your joining me tomorrow. <laughs> P.S. It's really hot down here. <laughs> I am pleased that the Internet Caucus could host this uh, important discussion today about the role of the government uh, in uh, the Internet and making government more friendly and usable and accountable through the Internet. But I have two notes of caution, and I hope the members of the panel will uh, attempt to address these today. One is the whole issue of privacy on the Internet. The government could be doing a much better job of protecting people's privacy. In fact, I would strongly argue that in most instances, private sector uh, businesses on the Internet are doing a better job of protecting privacy than government is. We want government to be open, we want it to be accessible, but that raises a number of interesting questions. For example, there are proposals to put all of our court records online. It <clears throat> sounds like a very good idea. They're accessible to you in the courthouse should you put them up on the Internet. Well, I would suggest to you that there may be some serious questions about aspects of that. For example, if you or you or anybody else here were involved in an automobile accident or some other personal injury, uh, would you want all of the discovery taken in your legal proceeding, the depositions, the interrogatories, which oftentimes are made a, uh, a part of the court record, and in most courts, certainly in our federal courts, the rules of discovery are very liberal, very open. You can ask almost any question as long as it's remotely related to the issue in the case. Uh, and that can be almost any question about almost anything you can think of. Do you want your neighbor to be able to go online and read about some of the th very, very personal things that might be asked to you about uh, what you're able to do or not do as a result of your personal injury or what your family background is and so on online? Or do we want to make people still have to go down to the courthouse to get that information? Or maybe even more importantly, do we want to have our legal system carefully review those current rules about what is a public record and what is not before we make the transition. I'm not objecting to the idea that all public records should be available online, but if they are, I think we ought to be reviewing what indeed a public record is. The second issue that gives me great concern is in making government more efficient and more helpful to our citizens, we've got to be very careful that it does not 
go into areas that have been and can be handled in the private sector. Uh, and we're seeing instances of that happen already. Uh, the Postal Service offering various email services and certified emails. Uh, the Internal Revenue Service uh, moving toward helping you do your tax return on an IRS site. Uh, is there a conflict of interest there if you're going to take their advice about whether or not uh, you're entitled to a particular deduction or not while you're completing your return online with them? Uh, and then the most egregious example I've seen so far, do we want taxpayer dollars used by government agencies as they have by the General Services Administration to actually advertise against private competitors uh, who are offering competitive services? There is uh, a service that GSA offers to have an online shopping mall so that procurement officers in various government agencies can go to this one central location and deal with a wide array of private businesses. Well, there are private companies that offer the same service, and uh, the GSA purchases advertising in various uh, media, challenging the legitimacy of the private competitor, pictures of the Mona Lisa and saying, would you deal with a counterfeit if you can do deal with the real thing or have the real thing. I think that there are a lot of gray areas here that we're getting into that call for some very careful analysis about the role of government in the Internet age, and I hope our panelists will touch on those as well as uh, the issue of how to make the government more accountable and efficient uh, in the Internet age. Thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing. Thank you, Congressman. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Uli Warner from uh, SAP. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and uh, having worked uh, together with Ari and uh, Tim Lorden from the Internet Education Foundation on that briefing book. It was a great pleasure to working with, uh, with both of them. I enjoyed it very much. And uh, I also enjoy being part, at least a small part, of that revolutionary change to our society which happens these days with the Internet. And e-government is definitely uh, a major part of government plays definitely a major part in that uh, in that revolution. It's my pleasure to introduce to to you Sean O'Keefe, Deputy Director of Office of Map Management and Budget. Um, Director O'Keefe came from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs from Syracuse University. He was the Louis A. Bantle Professor of Business and Government there, and prior to that. He was a professor of business administration at Penn State. And uh, before that, he had his career in the government as the Secretary of the Navy, appointed by President George Bush in 1992, and previously served as the controller and CFO of the Department of Defense. Before joining the Defense Department, he served on the staff of the United States Senate Committee of Appropriations for eight years and was staff director of the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee, and in 93 was awarded the Distinguished Public Service Award by President Bush and then Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney. He's uh, married and has three children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sean O'Keefe. Thanks very much, and first and foremost, it's a, a pleasure to be here. I've been confirmed uh, to this job all of now three weeks. This is my first opportunity to uh, uh, to conduct an activity here, and it's uh, one that I relish the chance to do that, particularly given the topic matter we're going to discuss here today. So I want to thank the Internet Caucus for the invitation to be here and the opportunity to spend a little time talking to you but and with you about an issue I think a very mutual interest across the federal government and certainly throughout the industry. Uh, Senator Leahy uh, mentioned that uh, March the 16th was the anniversary of the enactment of the Freedom of Information Act. I, I learned something every time I attend a forum like this, uh, and it was a fascinating commentary. I reflected a little bit on the notion that 35 years ago, I would imagine the authors of the FOIA had no idea at all, couldn't even dream of the extent to which information would be available 35 years after its enactment. It was designed at the time to deal with a very limited, by comparison, set of issues and problems that uh, had cropped up at that particular uh, period, 
and all very legitimate concerns, but ones that it's fascinating to see how much the intent of the act has modified and changed over the course of time, as well as the implications that have emerged, as we have just heard here a few moments ago, too, from Congressman Goodblatt over uh, the, the kinds of, of implications that may come from the extent and uh, and use of information across the board. So it really is, is quite remarkable to see how public policy in this particular context uh, has demonstrated not only a sense of, of, or a context of resilience and flexibility, but also adaptability to how much the technology has afforded us in this information age. It's really quite a remarkable event. Uh, on that point, though, Senator Leahy and I uh, depart because his proposal to try to revise and make uh, St. Patrick's Day coincident with this particular event, I think would really be a dramatic departure, and it's one that I couldn't support under any circumstances, uh, principally because, again, with a name like Sean O'Keefe, and I would think that a guy like, with a name like Patrick Leahy would also understand that if they were coincident events, we would feel at least a moral obligation to disclose what we were up to on St. Patrick's Day, which is uh, not the most uh, healthy of things and circumstances. So on that one, uh, he and I depart to the company on the issue of public policy. But we do agree, and again, I, I want to associate myself also with this, the context and the spirit of uh, Senator Lieberman's comments uh, as it pertains to the importance of information technology on the agenda of now uh, what I'm hearing is the United States Senate's concern, the Congress in general, but also at least from the two members that we heard from in that regard and again from Congressman Goodlatte, but also uh, on the Bush administration's management agenda. There's no question that it is, it is one of the most dominant uh, issues that I could think of. In the course of the last uh, two months, uh, again, since Inauguration Day, um, what I found really particularly fascinating about going to the Office of Management and Budget at this particular period of time is I've had the, 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 the distinction or honor or in privilege to have been involved in previous administrations, you've heard, uh, and to arrive at a time of transition when things occur uh, for the first time and policies are developed. But in each occasion, I've either been there at the time when you've been able to organize the, uh, the operation that you're dealing with and then proceed with the policy, or to deal specifically with the policy initiatives that they pertain to uh, the front end of the administration. In this case, I've had a chance to do both, and it's been the, uh, the, the, issue, the functional description of drinking from a fire hose would be a dramatic understatement of what it is we've been through in the last two months uh, in the effort of trying to put together not only the President's budget submission and the blueprint that you saw on February 28th, I hope, uh, as well as all the material that will support that here by April the 9th is when that will be released. So all that going on concurrently, the thing I found remarkable as it pertains to this particular issue is among all the issues that have been vetted, argued, debated, programs that have been uh, uh, dealt with, reviewed, examined over a very, very short period of time, and then in turn uh, decisions made about them at, uh, at as a rapid a clip as I've ever seen anywhere, uh, and lots of members of Congress that having, been, having been heard from about various issues that there is a particular concern about to make sure that as the budget is being prepared that there will be consideration for the one element, the one particular policy focus that has dominantly uh, resurfaced time and again throughout this entire thing, the one consistency, uh, has been the issue of information technology and how it will be employed specifically as part of the new administration's management agenda. Indeed, it is the only area that I saw in the context of a lot of iteration back and forth with departments and agencies as we were preparing uh, the, the, the specifics of the budget as we, it has been presented. Uh, the only thing that was common in every piece of paperwork to every single department and agency was a focus very dominantly on the question of information technology and capital planning thereof and how that would be, be uh, sorted through. And certainly, as you look through the, 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 the blueprint uh, released on February 28th, among the government reform initiatives dominant on that page is the initiative uh, to establish the EGOV um, initiative as we move along here. So making transformation to an electronic government, I think, is critically important. It's on the top of the agenda of the new administration. I think we've demonstrated that. It has consistently uh, been talked about uh, throughout the development of this very chaotic uh, process and one I can I think we'll continue to see more of as we move along here. And we're very committed to pushing agencies and moving along to, the, to be the deadlines uh, to establish e-government in all information transactions by the 2003 objective established in the Government Paperwork and Elimination Act. Uh, that's a, a reasonable objective in my view and one that I think that we should strive towards 
and I, the, the, inevitably the answer on our achievement of that particular task will turn on the agencies and departments that are already incorporating uh, information technology as widely as they possibly can will probably be the ones that achieve it. And those that are having difficulty uh, moving in that direction are the ones that are going to have the hardest time, and that's, that's where our attention will probably be more dominantly focused. Uh, but in the blueprint itself, in terms of the emphasis of eGov uh, as one of the primary management or government reform agenda items that we will be emphasizing over the course of the next several years, uh, noted too is, is a, I think, a context to that, which Senator Lieberman touched along as well. So I think there's a lot of room for negotiation between the administration and uh, those who advocate or will be advocating uh, his bill and the co-sponsors thereof uh, that centers around, I think, three fundamental aspects, three areas that we, we think are the most important aspect or develop element of how this public policy should be oriented. The first one is, is beyond anything else, it ought to be citizen-oriented. It ought to have a focus towards how individuals can use it. Uh, and in that regard, I'm uh, enough of a, of a technology Luddite that this is one that I read, uh, resonate to the context of something being referred to as user-friendly. Okay? And to that extent, it has to be. It's an imperative. It's got to be the first element of what we do here, uh, lest we end up with something that becomes a marvelous uh, technology or capability that can only be accessed by those who can speak a technologist language that is not the objective of what we're after. So as a consequence, I mean, that may be, that's a pleasant consequence, but it isn't necessarily very useful in terms of its, its wider applications and citizen-centered kind of focus. So that's, that's element number one is that the approaches we have to use to this uh, has to be to, to, to extend or provide greater citizen accessibility. The second one is it's got to be results-oriented. There's got to be a fundamental set of milestones that can be pointed to in terms of what, how we're going to achieve the objectives. Uh, today we spend better than $40 billion on information technology. I can't attest to you here at this moment that all of it is being spent the best way we know how. I couldn't say that. Matter of fact, in my time as the controller and chief financial officer of the Defense Department, it really pained me every year to sign the annual reports to the General Accounting Office on high risk areas that indeed we could report that we were not spending it efficiently. So my guess is unless there's been a marvelous, cathartic set of events that have occurred in the last several years at the Defense Department, that my guess is that that, that particular movement or testing to the, uh, and across the board in the federal government, the attesting to the most efficient use of $40 billion for information technology related assets and capital planning is not the, uh, uh, can't be argued as the best approach to it. 26,000 systems is what we have out there. So as a consequence, part of what we're going to be looking to is trying to determine what is the most efficient use of that enormous amount of, of, uh, of resource base that is already there in, in a way that is the most efficient in order to achieve that first objective, which is that it be citizen-oriented, and that we establish a series of uh, specific results in how we're going to accomplish that task. Um, the use of a number of different tools that the Congress has very helpfully enacted over the last several years, very recently, in the form of the Government Performance Results Act and efforts to try to establish very specific linkages there between the what it is you're budgeting for it and how are you going to gauge whether or not the outcome you sought is going to, is to be achieved uh, is something that uh, makes for a very useful application in this kind of a context because the effort itself of just saying, yes, let's, let's provide greater access in and of itself uh, can lead to the proliferation of an awful lot of different systems with not necessarily the same objectives. So as a result, this gives us a chance to, to do some efforts in which we really establish some performance criteria. The use of performance-based contracting practices, which has been advocated by Congress in lots of different uh, uh, legislative several years, presents a whole new opportunity as well to establish state up front what it is we want to have as the outcome of the stated objectives uh, as part of the contracting practice to assure that we're spending this in a way uh, that achieves the result we're looking for. And the third part uh, or focus of the approach that we've taken to this as one of the primary government reform initiatives is that it be market-based, that there be some you know, fundamental uh, focus of looking at a government-wide standard, which is uh, a paperless you know, process, one in which uh, linked to the financial system so that there in can, indeed can be uh, the access that is guaranteed or at least thought about as a primary objective in the first instance of it being citizen-centered, 
in that agencies use market-based incentives to encourage innovation, to save money in information technology cost and other areas, uh, through share and saving contracts that allow for retention of savings brought by technological innovation, and through greater use of competition among government agencies and private contractors. Uh, this is one area where we do not need to figure out a way to devise a unique government process for it. It is something that is, there are just so many options that are commercially available and approaches that we can look for in commercial innovation that certainly has led the way uh, that we need to access that more freely. So as a consequence, uh, encouraging that level of, of creativity throughout the industry in order to, to institute an EGAV initiative uh, that uh, it truly accomplishes the task that we're after in all three of those areas is what we're, what we're out for. So we lay out a broad outline in that, that um, uh, February 28th blueprint document uh, of an e-government fund in order to facilitate that. And Senator Lieberman, I'm just delighted to hear that he has endorsed that idea. And it's one that uh, he's anxious to put together legislation in order to make that, that uh, or facilitate that. So we look forward to working with him and his co-sponsor colleagues and anyone else who's, who's interested in trying to work through that particular issue, uh, an opportunity to operationalize what it is we proposed in that case. Uh, certainly the debate over how much is an issue that I think uh, we need to continue to join because in part I'd like to start from the proposition or the standard that we've got better than $40 billion we're spending in uh, information technology. And so to talk about a central fund, however big or small you want it to be, uh, is something that uh, uh, is a facilitating mechanism in order to better utilize that larger set of resources uh, that we have available and dedicated to this particular task. I think we miss a bet if all we do is focus on and argue about what the size of the, of the, uh, the, 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 the pump priming uh, fund would be in this particular case. So I, I look forward to working with him and others to try to figure out exactly how that can be best accomplished. And as a mark of, of, of our, our good faith in that context, uh, the President, in the course of his uh, discussions and uh, uh, comments about this during the course of the campaign last year, certainly discussed the proposition of establishing uh, such a program and to, to focus on eGov as a primary initiative. Uh, he's committed to a $100 million program over the next three years. And in order to get a better start on that, we're looking at spending $20 million next year to get rolling on that. Is that the right number? Again, it's worth debating with uh, our friends in Congress, but it is a, a demonstration of, of effort on our part that it's, uh, that's larger than the amount that was originally announced just a matter of a few weeks ago. So as a consequence, that I think, further demonstrates the resolve and interest in getting on with this initiative. Let's move it in a way that uh, will make this something happen in a relatively short period of time. Let me try to at least lay out uh, a handful of points of what would be the context of how something like this would operate, and then I'll quit. Uh, first of all, the idea that, of, of establishing a fund, again, I think Senator Lieberman's commentary on that point uh, is exactly consistent with where we're heading, and we're just delighted that, that the blueprint was apparently compelling enough that that was something he decided to pick up on from there. Uh, and it's, it would be administered through uh, OMB, as he suggested, as part of a GSA account. It would be coordinated uh, with the budget and appropriations process, which again is very much in the spirit of uh, the Government Performance and Results Act, and I think one that would give us an access and an opportunity to do a wider kind of examination of the 40 billion plus uh, of assets we have for information technology across the board. Uh, and importantly, this particular fund is again one that, that I think he would agree as we would, that it's a supplement, it doesn't replace the existing cross-agency support for information technology. This is designed as a more uh, focused way to try to, to supplement and get on with uh, initiatives that are most promising at a given time, as opposed to be instead of. So the one effort we've got to, to avoid, uh, and again, I, I, my apologies to any CIO in any department or agency for the next comment, which may be too blunt, which is we certainly don't want to have this substitute for what it is they're already planning. That's not our objective. Uh, and so as a result, uh, those who may see this as an opportunity uh, to shift the, the, the burden or cost of whatever else for uh, uh, specific initiatives, that is the one concern I think we need to stop early on uh, is the, the, the budget process uh, kind of manipulation that 
uh, some may become more familiar with than others, and certainly those in this particular field uh, shouldn't become a, a part of that particular aspect. So as a result, it is there as a, as a government-wide uh, focus or a one in which we can look at cross-cutting the agencies that would make that most interesting. It also support the infrastructure that builds on the foundation of the first Gov initiative that uh, launched, uh, as I understand it, in, in September of last year. Um, lots of uh, experience that has begun with that. That's a good first step uh, in moving in the direction we're looking for. And it is one that uh, is slowly gaining the kind of, uh, of accessibility and interest out there. As I understand it, it's on the order of about a million hits a week. Uh, which certainly could intensify over the course of time. But it's the first good, modest effort at trying to, to see the example and results of what we're trying to, to accomplish across the board. And I think um, an example of how you can get on with the, this kind of an initiative if it's properly focused. So we're very much in support of the first Gov, um, uh, you know, website approach to this and, and moving along with that in a way that is becoming a little more uh, accessible. Uh, last couple of points is, the, first of all, the, the, the fund would support projects to help uh, or would be designed specifically towards meeting the goal of the Government Paperwork Elimination Act goal of October of 2003, so that would become a very primary criteria in our mind uh, in terms of the kind of things that would, would be most important, again, rather than substituting for any other agency agenda. And the criteria for that funding would be refined over time in broad consultation with Congress. Uh, and other stakeholders, all of that want to participate in this particular effort. But first and foremost, the non-negotiable element is it's got to be interagency in its operation. Uh, the idea of creating individual stovepipes uh, that are unique to agency X or Y. Uh, again, I've, I've lived through that era, era in a previous incarnation, and I don't want to go back to it. It was not particularly fun at the time by creating some of the things we did or at least trying to deal with some of the, the individual unique systems that were out there at the time that were involved in that. I don't want to go back to that. Uh, it's got to involve different innovations, different ways of going about dealing with the problem, and it's got to have a capital planning element to it. How do you intend to carry this from here? It can't be a one-shot proposition. So if the criteria can be adopted as part of the overall legislation that now sounds like it's gaining steam, which would be great, uh, this may be something we could see achieved uh, in months rather than waiting uh, for the, the effort to be unfolded here uh, over the course of the next year. So we look forward to working with uh, uh, all the members who are involved in this, Senator Lieberman and his interest particularly, in working uh, to accomplish what is a mutual objective. And again, I want to thank you all very much for the opportunity to be here and uh, a chance to spend a little time explaining the administration's uh, view of where we're going. Thank you. Um, Mr. O'Keefe has agreed to to answer questions, we have time for two, so I would like to encourage you to let me know whether anybody has a question. Yeah. Do you support Please. the CIO? Um, I think the, the, we're really sorting through the issue of exactly how that's got to work. The Clean Cohen Act is pretty explicit in terms of how this works in departments and agencies, and among the many um, functions of the Deputy Director for Management who were still in the vigorous effort of recruiting. Uh, among the, the, the many uh, items on the agenda item for that individual would be to act as the information officer. The one effort I really want to be sure that we're careful not to create, and one, that's one of the things I really want to, and I've talked to Senator Liebman specifically about this and his staff a lot prior to, to, uh, to working through uh, this particular initiative, is that we not create an individual or, or embody focus uh, an agenda on a part of an individual. Uh, that would in turn then provide the opportunity for others to view their responsibility of looking at information technology as dismissed. We don't want to create a position that, 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 that as the consequence is absolution for those who would otherwise not want to worry about information technology and its integration within their department or agency, or whether it's federally focused or not. And that's one hazard, I think, of creating a stovepipe kind of, of opportunity like that that isn't fully integrated with, again, all the things that are embodied in the Government Performance Results Act of looking at performance, the budget process, the management systems in order to carry it out, establishing the goals, we don't want another advocate who is only in a position of being the head cheerleader. Uh, and so it's really very important that we make sure that, that the context and scope of that particular initiative that he has talked about, that we're certainly willing to negotiate and work with him, 
would have a very specific context and is, is part of the agenda that every organization should have and that the Office of Management and Budget would be required to organize and certainly focus in that arena the better. I, mean, I think this falls in the same kind of category. If you, if you um, anoint someone to be the individual who is most responsible and concerned about security, it again somehow very indirectly, inadvertently, unintendedly, if it creates the case in which that creates absolution for everybody else not to worry about it, uh, that's a problem. Uh, if instead it's, a, it's an integral part of the process, that's um, uh, in reiterating that, that's the most critical way to do that. And I'm in a clubhouse turn, I'll give you this last point, which is that uh, as, as a result, our job on an office management budget very directly you know, on the privacy issue is to focus on the policy focus and, and direction. I really don't want to see it implemented there at all. It is more appropriately done at the department and agencies and at the points in which it has its, its greatest context. But it is something as a policy matter we need to stay focused on and be very uh, explicit about uh, preservation of the rights of individuals and, and privacy thereafter. So uh, in that context, I, I think it's a, it's, it has a policy question on our side, less an implementation point. Are, are you saying that you don't think you'd have a privacy counselor like the Clinton administration had and that it should be handled on the agencies? Security we have very, uh, I've spent a lot of time, frankly, as a matter of fact, in the last few days talking to some very talented staff at OMB who are focused very dominantly on this question. Uh, I don't know what would be accomplished by having yet another elevated individual in that kind of context, which again would create the image that somehow, since somebody is worrying about it at that level, therefore it doesn't need to. I think we've got to be more diligent in making sure this is understood. Uh, at the department and agency level specifically, and it's our task to make sure that stays on the top of their agenda. I'm sorry, sir, you had one? Uh, yes. Uh, as you think about uh, uh, how the process is going to work on your Yes, sir. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you all again. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Keith. It's my pleasure to hand over the podium to the moderator of our panel, Pat McInnes from the Center of Excellence in Government. First thing I'm going to try to do is move the podium so we can all sit here in a more informal way. Please come and join us. Please come sit at the front. Um, I'm Pat McGinnis. I'm President and CEO of the Council for Excellence in Government. We are new members of the Internet Caucus Advisory Board and very pleased to be part of this. Clearly the members and leaders of the Congressional Internet Caucus are to be commended for bringing together the energy and creativity of not only all the people in this room, but the members of the caucus throughout the Congress and all of the other organizations that are involved. Um, we know about the potential of the Internet to change the way we work, the way we learn, the way we communicate, and the way we govern ourselves. Um, the big idea here, in our view, is something we are calling E the People. And um, Gutenberg's printing press respond a renaissance in each of the dimensions that I mentioned, and I think the Internet has the potential and the power to do even more, and we ain't seen nothing yet. I think you would all agree. We're on the verge of something really big, and you're the ones that are going to help make it happen. 
uh, not only in your roles as leaders in government, in business, and in the nonprofit civic community, but also in your roles as citizens, because we care about this not only because of our institutional positions, but because of ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, and the people to come. Um, at the Council for Excellence in Government, we think about our very ambitious mission, Excellence in Government, both in terms of performance and results, and also connecting government more vibrantly with citizens around the country, actually getting them into the act of governing and uh, raising their confidence and trust in government. Our members are leaders in the private and nonprofit sectors who've served in government. They include people like Paul O'Neill, who's the Secretary of the Treasury, who was a founder of the council. Um, Scott Harshbarger, who was Attorney General in Massachusetts, who's now the President of Common Cause. We have a very diverse membership, very interesting group of people. And of course, as we think strategically about how to leap forward to excellence in government, we have to think about the Internet and information technology. This is the way to change in a non-incremental way, to make big change. Um, so we brought together, and actually people joined in this in a wonderful way, what turned out to be 350 people from the various sectors to create a blueprint for e-government that's embodied in a report we released last month called e-government, the next American revolution. And that's because we really do believe this is a revolution. We also believe that we are just at the beginning of it. So there's a lot to do. Um, we think that this is a way of making our government of, by, and for the people as our founders conceived it. And we know from our opinion research, we work with Peter Hart and Bob Teeter, that people around the country, especially young people, no longer think of it that way. They think of it as the government rather than our government. And as we look at the future, look at young people in the country, we see a couple of things that are striking to me. One is that the Internet is part of their connective beings. I know my 15-year-old daughter does virtually everything she does on the Internet in part, almost everything. She communicates with her friends. She shops. She does her homework. She does her research. She checks the weather, everything. And so that's what the future is like. And if we don't create that kind of a future in government for these kids, they are going to turn away from it even more than they are now, and that's quite a lot. That's the, the other thing, point I'm going to make, which is we know not only from our research, but we know from our own conversations and experiences that young people do not see government as very relevant to their lives. They're not voting much. They're not choosing government service. They just don't see it. Um, very different from the founding fathers. Think back to Thomas Jefferson. He was a very young man when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. This was a, a passion felt by young people and probably a passion for government felt by most of us in this room when we got involved in our work um, in public service. So it strikes me that e-government not only has the potential of creating uh, connections to citizens and improving performance, but maybe this is a way to draw young people into government, to get them interested in designing, creating, and carrying out a whole new paradigm in the way we govern ourselves. So think about it. I think that's part of the revolution. I just want to mention some results of two of our most recent polls on uh, e-government before I introduce our very distinguished panel to talk about the potential of e-government. Um, we did find that a large majority of people believe that e-government should be a high priority for this president. It's actually striking how big these numbers are. Um, we know that people are increasingly online, but uh, there are many more people that think e-government has tremendous potential than are online. Um, we also know that um, the vision of e-government that people have goes far beyond services and operations. People are more interested, for example, in seeing their representatives' voting records and being able to hold them accountable online than renewing their driver's license online. So this is not just about service delivery. This is about revitalizing our democracy. Um, a third point, which is extremely important, is that people are quite concerned about the issues of privacy and security. They are different from each other, but there's a lot of concern both about privacy and security to the point where people are saying 
go slow. Don't move too fast until you solve these problems. I think that means for us that we have to face up to these issues uh, through public and private partnership efforts. The vision that we have in our blueprint, I think, is definitely the vision that we share. It's a government truly of, by, and for the people. It's about interaction as much as it is about services and transactions. Um, it's about a government that organizes itself around the needs of people, not the organizations and agencies and committees that exist, but really thinks and offers itself in a very different way. Our government of the future, not the government of the past. It has to be, as others have said, easy to use, accessible to everyone, private and secure, and innovative. We have to invest in this. We've talked a little bit about numbers. The numbers in our report are much bigger than the numbers you have heard here. <laughs> and we believe, in fact, that the numbers have to be much bigger. But let's start and let's see if we can make that a much bigger investment. We know the cost savings down the road are enormous. And the examples that you all know about tell you that the savings could become larger than the investment over time, but we have to invest. Um, we have to work through interagency, intergovernmental, and public-private partnerships. And we have to eliminate the digital divide in order to make this work. So let me, um, with that overview, turn to our very interesting panel who bring a diversity of perspectives to this issue. Let me introduce them. And then we'll talk about the potential and engage your questions. Uh, first, to my right, uh, Nancy Cronick is currently president of the American Library Association. She's on leave as the Associate Dean of Libraries at New York University, where she manages library and audiovisual services, NYU TV, and a cable television network. Now, that's not the librarian that I remember. <laughs> Um, she's an expert on digital libraries, government information, telecommunications policy, freedom of information, and issues of access and equality. If you look at the things she's written, you get an idea of uh, just what she knows and can contribute. She's the author of Libraries, the New Media, and the Political Process, Staking a Claim for Public Space and Cyberspace, and the Internet Access and Democracy. Very interesting perspective. Uh, next, uh, Brad Bradley is a founder and executive vice president of NIC, which, as you all know, provides e-government services primarily to state and local governments. He has significant experience in portal development and management. He's worked both in the state of Kansas and the state of Indiana to create award-winning, citizen-centered, user-friendly portals. Um, and he's recognized as a leading expert across the country. Larry Brandt, finally, is the uh, director of the Digital Government Program at NSF, which is a great program. We partner with NSF in this, and, and it's a wonderful way of bringing together the research community, the academic research community, with people in government and people in business to make this all very relevant and focused. Um, Larry also helped create the Federal World Wide Web Consortium, uh, which is uh, a way of bringing together the uh, webmasters and information technology community from across government. And he has also led a feasibility study of online voting, which has just been completed and he might say a word about. So let me start uh, with Nancy and we'll just go down the line and ask you to talk about what you see as the potential of the Internet to change government. Well, almost 20 years ago, I started coming down to Washington to talk to people in, uh, on the government side about how we need to make sure that electronic information was available to the public. And we spent many years hearing about how we were going to break the back of the U.S. Treasury if we had such a thing and hearing all the reasons why this was just not feasible. Well, since then, not only have a few people started to wake up not only to the potential of this uh, technology, but some of the problems as well. Um, we've really gone from an age of scarcity to abundance. And I think nobody sees that more than librarians every day. That in discovering all these great potentials, we also have to recognize the impact of what it is to live in a world of abundance. It's a very different world from the world of scarcity. 
for us, access is critical to make sure that everyone has the right to participate. We see the libraries in our communities as the first place where everyone in the community has access to government, to information, and to be informed citizens so they can participate. And I think we always have to keep this concept in mind. The idea of digital democracy is really about full participation and how do we make sure everyone in our communities can participate. Another key issue for us, of course, is content how to collect it, organize it, and make it accessible. And the word access is one I want to say a little bit about because I think um, our speaker before and several of the issues that have come up today really relate to this. When we were talking with government officials 20 years ago, they were talking about access meaning at OMB or at an agency. You may remember we had three reading rooms for the Securities and Exchange Commission around the country and they called that access. And we kept saying, no, we're talking about dissemination. And dissemination is very different. Dissemination is actively making public. And I think that's part of the transition that's going on here. Going from access available a few places to um, what we're putting up on the internet really becomes dissemination. And dissemination means making public. And therefore, we have to bring in all of those issues that making public um, bring up. And nobody has discovered this more than librarians probably, of what it's like when you first deliver information to the public, what kinds of experiences they're having, and just how fragile access to information is. And you break in the chain if you don't collect it, if you don't organize it in a way so you can find it, if you don't disseminate it, if those URLs disappear overnight, which happens every day in the U.S. government, and on January 20th, lots of them just vanished. Um, if you don't make sure the public has the skill to use these resources, these are what we see as critical to the potential that we have to worry about all of these issues. And so we say to those who are looking to the future, the future is equipment, it is software, but far more importantly, it's the abilities to use these resources in every community in America. We can certainly share with you our experience. Um, those of us who are on campuses, those of us in public communities have worked very closely with those communities to become e-communities, e-campuses, e-cities, e and recognize this, is, this means not just bringing in equipment, it means retooling all of our staff, it means changing the way we structure, the way we work. We have to work across all lines now. We have to coordinate in a way we never did before. So when you hear about the cost of investing in these activities, the real cost is the people cost and the restructuring cost and how do we look at how we do things differently. Because if we really want to start delivering information, disseminating information in a way that's really effective and that really makes sure that everyone can participate in our communities, that means people with disabilities, with other languages, with various literacy levels, and people who are just plain information illiterate, we really have to rethink the way we, we operate. So I will stop there and let others pick up. Thanks, Brad. Brad. Um, well, I've been doing electronic government for 13 years, and uh, we, we manage portals in 13 states and a half a dozen, including the state of Virginia, uh, half a dozen cities from Tampa to San Francisco, and we deal with those issues as you do every day. Um, we don't do anything that the governments don't approve. So we, we're not taking the information and selling it behind the door or anything like that. Um, we advise and assist the governments in figuring out issues like what records should remain public uh, because now they really are public instead of just being labeled public. And um, we, we build a lot of uh, filing software to let people interact with the government. We, uh, we have, the, for instance, the Federal, Elect uh, Federal Election Commission filing software is a product of NIC. Uh, so we wrestle with these problems every day. What I know is that citizens just want service. And um, they want to go to their library when they need to know something about this. 
but uh, more and more the content is disseminated, as you said. So the library is not the repository of the content, the library is the facilitator. Uh, similarly, we are invisible. If you go to the State of Virginia's website, you will not see NIC anywhere on that website. But uh, the State of Virginia has a board. Through that board, they have contracted with a private manager to capitalize, develop, and uh, manage that website. That's us. So um, the board gives us policy direction and has to approve fees. Now, one of the nice things about virtually all of our websites is that they are built without tax dollars. And as a result, um, they, we have been able to use the money from services that businesses want to put up content that citizens want and not have to charge citizens for that content. So that's one of the features, particularly as the, the economy turns bad, that people are interested in, again, uh, in a way that they weren't when all of a sudden they had flush budgets. So um, I mean, that's what we do. And, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in your questions. I'd like to hear what you, what you are worried about because as, um, as you said, privacy and security are two different issues and uh, we deal with those all the time. Um, so, Larry? Thank you very much. Um, I, I guess I'd like to say first that uh, everything I've heard today is such music to my ears. Uh, we've been working at NSF since 1992 and uh, the very first web browser came out of one of our supercomputing centers uh, to realize this kind of a vision. And uh, for years we argued that uh, uh, some of the things you've heard today everyone agreed on, everyone didn't used to agree on. And we're now, uh, you know, about to leave the, the on the train, now about to leave the station, and we're heading in the right direction. And there's some some disagreements about the nuances, as, as I think of them, of whether we should have a CIO, federal CIO, and, and who that person should report to and, and where the, the pot of money is and how big it is. But there's no disagreement at all that this is what we should be doing and that information technologies are where government can go to improve its efficiencies in, in times of shrinking budgets. So uh, if, if I heard nothing other than what I heard from, uh, from the first speakers today, I would go go back to my agency very happy. Um, Pat asked us to think a little bit about the potential of the Internet to change government. Um, it, it already is changing government dramatically. Uh, governments are generally a, a fairly uh, conservative operation, and I think that's the way the citizens like it. If you look at how fast government agencies have taken Internet technologies up and made them a core part of their business process, I think that's just remarkable agility on the part of the agencies. And it's a testament to how compelling the technologies are. So I, I think you can take a look at, uh, at what we've done in the last five years, and you can extrapolate as well as anyone else can. It, it was amazing to me to hear uh, Senator Lieberman uh, or Senator Leahy, I don't recall which one, talk about uh, uh, somebody who had, had said uh, the juice was all wrung out of the Internet. Um, Every statistic that I look at from the number of packets on the Internet to the number of countries and, and the number of languages on the Internet to the number of people who use the Internet from home, the curve has been for, this, for the last 10 years the same curve, reaching toward infinity. Now, it's obviously going to tail off at some point, but we're a long ways away from that because this is a truly international technology. And so when we think just about what's happening in this country or Eastern Europe or Western Europe, uh, we need to realize that China is just over the horizon. So uh, the technologies certainly are not wrung out, and there's plenty of juice left. And, and my job in funding academic research, partnering with government agencies, is to create the new technologies that will inject new juice into the Internet. Um, I was, was trying to think of, a, of an example of, of how the Internet had changed government. I, I think any of us in this room could come up with a half a dozen I ran across one I thought was fairly interesting. Uh, when the, uh, FEMA went into the job of, of doing home inspections after uh, Hurricane Andrew, in the course of 60 days using fairly paper technologies, they were able to do about 90,000 home inspections. These are uh, what you need to get back in your house. When the North Ridge earthquake hit, uh, using new technologies a few years later, the Internet, modems, uh, interactive data, they were able to do three to four times as many home inspections in the same period of time. And these are activities that really reflect 
uh, and affect the day-to-day -day life of people in disaster situations. I think you could replicate that kind of a of a uh, of an improvement in service all around the, the country if you were just looking for it. And and as Pat said, we ain't even got started yet. So I'll stop there. Well, can I add just one yeah. thing? Uh, well, that um, I agree that that's that's impressive. That that strikes me as an example of doing the same government better, uh, which is um, you know. The government doesn't fundamentally change, but you can do it a lot more efficiently. And that's, that's very important because that's one of the greatest benefits for this. The, the example that I like to use is all these years that I've been working with states to set up portals, uh, not just in those two states mentioned, but in others, uh, they always, the agencies always come in and say, here is what we would like to tell people. And my standard response has always been, Yes, but what do people want to hear? Not, not really that they only want to be heard the good, told the good news, but there, there is a way that they want to interact with government, which may be different than the way that government is set up. And the advantage of technology, one of the advantages, as I see it, is that you don't have to change the government's way of doing things in order to give the citizen what they want. That translation can take place by setting up the website in a way that the citizens like and then moving the information around or reordering it or whatever so that the government gets it the way they want. So the government doesn't have to change. The citizens get what they want, and the magic takes place in between. Well, we, um, we're going to be on time. We are scheduled to end at about uh, 145, so I'm going to turn to you and ask you for your questions or your thoughts about the potential of um, the Internet for government <laughs> in our final few minutes. Please introduce yourself. There may be. I don't know. The, he's talking, I think, about federal agencies. Um, our experience, although we have federal contracts, as I mentioned, our experience is primarily with states and local governments. And um, what we have found there, and, and I found this when I was a, it took me four, five, six, five, six years to set up the first one of these as a citizen volunteer. I was not an employee of the government. I was not an employee of this company. And um, I knew as a practicing lawyer that I was paying a number of information providers already, and if I could get what I needed, I would be willing to pay something because there was a value associated with it. I all, otherwise, I had to pay someone to go down to I had the elevator down, drive over, I had the elevator up, stand in line, you know, call back to me, is this what you want, or if they don't have this, or what will I do now? Okay, pay the copy cost, all that. Right? I'd be, I could sit at my desk be on the phone, be getting something on my computer that's accurate and fast, and I'd be willing to pay something for that. So we turned that idea in Kansas because there was no money available. I mean, it was a choice of not doing it at all or doing it some other way, um, into uh, providing business services using the money from the business services to run the portal and to provide the citizen services without cost. It's not fair to say that the citizen services are free because nothing is ever free. Somebody always has to pay for it. But they're without cost to the citizens that are using them at the time. So that's the way it works in the, in the states where we are. Now, the, the city's um, supplemental uh, um, fee funding or transaction-based funding is a supplement because there's smaller base uh, population and smaller number of transactions means that they're, they're, unless the price is higher, which would be, I mean, that's a market-determined thing. Uh, at what point does the business see more value in sending a runner downtown than they do in getting it off the computer? Um, so, but, I mean, there are only three sources of money for this. I mean, it's either tax money out of someone's pocket, or it's transactions, or it's advertising, and that's been highly overrated, as we're finding out. It, it's only a supplement, too. 
and there are other public trust issues that we're, we find we're pretty good at there that muck up the advertising situation for government. I think we have to remember, though, that when we look at these budgets, what are we really looking at? If we're looking at the cost of the computer equipment and the software, it is such a small piece of this, again. You know, you create government information. Somebody still has to collect it. Somebody has to create the format. It may eventually cost the government less to do the disseminating. You know, when they were telling us we were breaking back a government because of going electronic, now they're telling us we can't have it in print because it's too expensive, okay? But what we're doing is we're passing down the line, these costs. You know, you may have a free portal. The library is a free portal, too. We invest a tremendous amount of people time, space, everything else to help the public interpret this information. I'm give one great example is my favorite IRS publications. We have been debating now with the IRS for years. We are a disseminator. We disseminate in print with their form service and now electronic. Right. What happens to us on April 15th, coming soon, we have people storming libraries, fighting with each other, and telling the librarians to do their forms for them. I cannot tell you the expense that is passed down the line. We are very happy to do this, but it's hard to find librarians that want to advertise because they are breaking the back of other government agencies down the road. And you can't discount the high cost of still transacting information business. It is estimated that 60% of our economy, or 60% of our workers, do something in the information business. I assure you, the, the price tag we just got from OMB is not taking into account all of the expenses of collecting, maintaining, organizing, and then interpreting this information. Yeah, that's, that's dividing up um, electronic government into pieces. I mean, there's, uh, we were impatient. I was impatient as an attorney when I was a volunteer to get whatever they had already out. Then there's going back and getting all the stuff they have from the past and digitizing it right. or else it won't be Legacy available. Data. Then there's <laughs> preserving <laughs> you know, and archiving. You know, how how useful is it to have it online if you still have to collect it in paper? So now you want an electronic filing um, application. Um, and and you're exactly right. We we do electronic filing of income tax returns in states in several states and there's a blip in January when all the people that are expecting refunds file. And then it's pretty flat until April fourteenth. And then it goes like this. So you have to have a server that'll handle this, even though the rest of the year you only need this much. So same kind of a problem. It's all applied by the states, too, and some of us pay local taxes as right. well. So, you know, just how much the information is just diffusing, and it really has great expense everywhere, but, you know, it depends how you count. Well, thank you very much, and, and thanks to Ari Schwartz and the Internet um, Advisory um, Committee. Um, I think this has been an incredible program today, starting with um, with Senator Leahy and Senator Lieberman, Congressman Goodlatte, and then having Sean O'Keefe from OMB. Thank you all for being can, here. Can I ask one last thing? Yeah. Can we give our phone numbers if we'd like in case they want to talk to us separately? Phone numbers, how about our email address? <laughs> Either way. I can't cope with the phone anymore. <laughs> all right. Well, let's let everybody give you a big hand first. Okay. <laughs>